I have the honor of introducing Ellen Brown, who with this audience here needs no introduction. Ellen, an attorney and writer, single-handedly through her writing and interviews, in particular through her book, Web of Debt, The Shocking Truth About Our Money System and How We Can Break Free, has done as much or more than any other author or economist to educate us on the fundamental issue of money and banking and we, how we can solve most problems of our country, our states, counties, cities, and the world by democratizing our monetary and banking systems and taking back the money power to we the people where it belongs to serve the public interest. We are so grateful to Ellen for her tireless working trying to save our economy and our democracy. She is a real hero of our times. We consider it an absolute privilege to work with her in this effort to democratize our money. And without further ado, Ellen Brown. Thanks, Dan, you make me cry. <laughs> it's been a privilege to work with you all. It's just been great. Um, all right, I wanted to add something about the Quaker Center. I understand that they've also divested, that uh, they've moved their money out of Wells Fargo into a uh, uh, credit union. <laughs> Very progressive. So I'm going to talk then uh, how we can go from austerity to prosperity with publicly owned banks. Uh, I'll start out with a joke which uh, characterizes the situation we're in today. So this alien lands in New Orleans and uh, uh, is greeted by the mayor as he steps out of his spaceship. And uh, he looks around and sees all this devastation and he says, what, what happened here? And the mayor said, well, we had this horrible hurricane and it flooded the entire city a year ago. And the alien said, uh, well, really, uh, why hasn't it been uh, repaired? And he said, well, uh, or the alien said, so I guess you don't have the workers to do the work. And, and the mayor said, oh, no, no, we have plenty of workers. And he said, well, you must then you must not have the materials to do the rebuilding. Said, no, the mayor said, no, no, we've, we've, got the, we've got the materials. What we don't have are these little green pieces of paper that you need to get the workers and the materials together so that you can do the work. And um, the alien says, uh, <clears throat> beam me up, Scotty. There's no intelligent life on Earth. <laughs> So that's what we're working for here, is a more intelligent way to get workers and materials together so they can produce products and services. Um, yeah, I'm sorry about this PowerPoint. You can't see it very well, but I can see it well enough that I can use it for a prompter. <laughs> uh, so here we are back at the home of not only the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, uh, but of paper government issued money and public banking. The uh, Philadelphia Quakers didn't actually invent public banking, but they developed the most sustainable model. That uh, William Penn brought the, he was uh, given all of Pennsylvania by, uh, it was in response to a debt owed by the king to his father. And so he brought the Quakers here who were heavily persecuted, as you can tell from that st uh, statue outside of the woman, Mary, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her last name, but uh, she, she was actually hung in the Boston Commons in, uh, say the name? Oh, Mary, Mary Dyer, uh, in Boston Commons, not for being a witch, or, but for actually preaching Quakerism. I and mean, it's hard to believe that there was ever a time when we were that um, narrow-minded or that um, stuck in a belief system, but I think maybe in a hundred years we'll look back on this time as being stuck in a belief system about money that really makes no sense. So it was Benjamin Franklin that actually, he didn't invent this system either, but he popularized it 
he wrote this little booklet called A Modest Inquiry into the Na Nature and Necessity of a Paper Currency. He was a printer, and so he printed these up and distributed them throughout the colonies. It was very popular. Uh, so that idea was spread. He, he was just very impressed. He had come at the age of 17 from Boston, and um, that was in 1723, and then in 1729 he wrote this booklet, so he was, he was only 23 years old. But he was just impressed with the prosperity that was there in Pennsylvania because of this system. The uh, colonists were opposed to taxes. It was they had governors who were appointed from England. They weren't, you know, they weren't the representatives of the colonists. And even if they had been willing to pay taxes, they didn't really have the money for it. They didn't, they didn't have their own. They weren't allowed to issue their own currency. So they, they basically had imported currencies from. England and other places. I mean, they used whatever they could get, like tobacco leaves. Uh, so uh, the governor of Massachusetts got this idea when he had to fight a little local war and didn't have any money for it, that he just printed up these little receipts. And they were basically IOUs acknowledging that uh, to the soldiers and the workers that value had been given. And, and then these little receipts traded in the community. I mean, it's the whole community's debt. And so the whole community acknowledge these receipts and and that became their money supply and this actually worked very well the one problem these were supposedly advances against taxes and uh, some of the colonies tended to they weren't too good about the taxing they were great about the spending but they they didn't tax it back and so they wound up inflating the money supply which then devalued it um, but there was a more sustainable solution that was used by most of the colonies, also had these land banks. So instead of just spending the money, they would lend the money to usually farmers, um, and then that money would come back. And so, so that was a sustainable feedback loop. And what particularly made it sustainable was that the interest was a public asset. So it went back into the economy rather than being siphoned off in the way that a private banking system does. So during the time that Pennsylvania had this system in place, they were, they were the best of these models. They paid no taxes at all, except for an excise tax on liquor. Um, the prices did not inflate as a result of money printing. There was some inflation due to shortages, but that was different. And there was no government debt. So the, the way the system worked would be, you might print $105, assuming you're using dollars. I don't think they were called dollars. And then you would lend $100 at 5% interest. And then you, you could spend $5 into the economy uh, on your budget. So there you've got $105 out there circulating. So you've got enough money to pay principal and interest. So $105 comes back. Then you lend the 100 again, spend the 5 again, and it all comes back. So you don't have to inflate the money supply in order to cover the interest, unlike in a private system where the banks always take back more money than they put out. And because virtually all of our money today is created by banks in the form of loans, there's never enough money out there without somebody taking out another loan. So the whole thing is sort of a parasitic pyramid scheme. So would that work today? Could we eliminate taxes today if we followed their system? We actually could. We could eliminate in income taxes. Uh, in 2011, we paid 1.1 trillion in income taxes, uh, and the banks collected collectively 725 billion in interest. But we also paid 454 billion in interest on the federal debt. Now, had we been borrowing from our own central bank all along, with the central bank rebating the interest to the government, as it would if it was a public bank we could eliminate that debt as well. So that would be 1.1 uh, trillion, or this is actually more than 1.1 trillion, could be eliminated so we, would, we could replace income taxes if public banking, or if banking were a public utility. Um, in fact, we could do that today by just, uh, the, either the Treasury could print up the money, which they're actually authorized to do, where Congress is empowered to coin money and regulate the value thereof. We, they could print up uh, 15 trillion, 15 one trillion dollar coins, put it in a bank account, and just start writing checks on it. And they could, they could 
buy out their own debt or that Federal Reserve could do it with quantitative easing as you know we know they've done it for several several trillion they could do it for 15 trillion if they wanted to and just rip up the debt and replace it with dollars but of course everybody says would say this would be inflationary but it actually wouldn't because you can see that this is our federal debt on the left this is our money supply on the right they're the same in other words our debt is our money supply debt is a little pink piece of paper which is an IOU of the government um, dollar bills are little green pieces of paper which are promissory notes Federal Reserve notes they're also an IOU they're an IOU of the government the difference is that dollar bills don't bear interest and bonds do so we could get rid of the interest by just replacing the pink pieces of paper with green pieces of paper <laughs> Uh, so this worked for the colonies up to the seven, colonists up to the 1750s when the merchants started complaining because they were dealing with some of them had deflated and the currencies were all different and, and they, so they leaned on the king who then forbade uh, most of the colonies from issuing their own, issuing these paper strip but they allowed a few to still do it, one of which was Pennsylvania. Uh, the, the, the alternative system, what, what they were using in England was um, a private, private banking system in which it originated with the, well in England it originated with the goldsmiths in the 17th century who would um, take people's gold for safekeeping and they would issue these little notes which became bank notes for the gold. So it was just basically again a receipt for the gold. Uh, but the customers preferred carrying the receipts around to the to carrying the gold, which is heavy and expensive, and um, I mean, sorry, heavy and dangerous. It could be stolen, and there were other people that wanted to borrow these notes, but they too preferred the little paper receipts. So the goldsmiths early on discovered that they could issue up to ten times as many of these uh, of these notes as they had gold, and nobody would be the wiser. So basically, nine notes were counterfeit but that was called fractional reserve lending meaning they only kept the fraction of the gold on reserve that they that their notes represented and we, that's the basis of the 10 percent reserve requirement that we still have today so that system was institutionalized with the Bank of England in uh, um, 1694 again it happened it occurred when the king needed money to fund a war and so he borrowed from this group of lenders who were allowed to set up the Bank of England and issue their banknotes as the national currency. And this debt never, never had to be repaid. It was just the interest that was repaid. The debt was just rolled over. So basically the, the British were renting their money from this private group of lenders. Again, the lenders were issuing many more notes than they had gold. So it was actually a largely counterfeit system. Uh, so Pennsylvania was one of the few states that were or colonies that were allowed to carry on with their script until uh, Benjamin Franklin uh, went to London and tried to plead the case for all the colonies. He said this was such a great system that before Pennsylvania had the system, nobody wanted to come there. There was no money and tr trade, little trade. And then now that they had their own currency, the people were flooding in and. Um, the banking system worked great and even in those colonies where they did overprint it was responsible for a lot of development that wouldn't have otherwise occurred. So this had the opposite effect of what he intended. The Bank of England was quite alarmed and leaned on the king and so the king then said all the colonies couldn't issue their own script. So that meant there was a radical contraction of the money supply. They had to pay taxes in basically a foreign currency, which they didn't have, so they had to borrow it from the British bankers, putting the farmers into debt, and they were losing their farms. So they rebelled and went back to issuing their own money. This is considered an act of rebellion, and that precipitated the American Revolution. So, so say some authorities. <laughs> so. Um, we went, the colonists won the, America, the revolution, but they lost the power to create money, largely because they didn't understand, didn't understand it. But that's a whole other 
story, which I don't really have time to go into, but it's all in my book, Web of Debt, if, you, if you're interested. Um, Abraham Lincoln then, uh, during the Civil War, reinstated the system of uh, government-issued money of the colonists, which worked very well. He, the North won. He avoided a massive debt to the British and Wall Street bankers, which that they were actually trying to impose uh, usurious interest rates on the North to trap them into debt in the same way that the South was trapped into debt. Um, but, and also there was a, uh, a lot of development during that period. There was extra money for development. But obviously he was assassinated. That, that period did not, um, that system did not prevail. Then in the 1890s, the populace attempted to reinstate this system. Uh, this was uh, the march of Coxey's army on, the first ever march on Washington was in 1894. Um, this was, the, the, the purpose was to attempt to get Congress to go back to the, uh, to, to issue money in order to build new roads and to give some money to the states, which, you know, would be interest-free loans. Um, but again, they failed. Uh, however, that was the basis of the book, uh, Frank Baum's Wizard of Oz, which is also the theme of my book, and it's the theme of Bill Still's movie, which I'm sure he'll tell you about later. Um, so meanwhile, uh, the public banking system moved to other countries. Uh, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada all had their own public banking systems that worked very well until the Bank of England again got alarmed and suppressed it. And that's that's also another story which I'm writing another book now on public banking, so I'm going I'm going into that in detail. It's really quite interesting. Um, so the the solution from the point of view of the Bank of England was this new system called central banking where in starting in, in Australia, they said the Commonwealth Bank was made into a central bank that would issue the currency and lend it to the government. So instead of the treasury issuing the currency directly, the government issuing the currency, the bank would issue it and lend it. And at the top of this system would be the Bank of England controlling how much money they could let out. And of course, then they started clamping down on Australia and other uh, former colonies saying that they were being irresponsible in all this, mon oops, all this uh, money printing and that they had to contract their money supplies, which then did pro propel them into depression like everyone else in the 30s. Um, the emissary sent out by the Bank of England was Sir Otto Niemeyer, who was governor of the Bank of England. Um, and so he helped set up the Commonwealth Bank of Australia as a central bank. And then he set up the Reserve Bank of New Zealand as a central bank. Uh, and in 1937, he became chairman of the Bank for International Settlements. So you can see that this system moved from being headed by the Bank of England to being headed by the BIS in Basel, Switzerland. But it was obviously the same central banking system. Um, how New Zealand then issued national credit, they, they rebelled, their political party, social credit party got in and started doing amazing things with national credit. And Australia did the same, had done the same thing, but they were both suppressed by England. Uh, Canada in um, 1935 passed the Bank of Canada Act, which allowed them to issue national credit to fund, fund uh, public projects. Oops, sorry. Hmm. Well, all right, did I skip one? I'm sorry. Anyways, uh, it looks like I'm on <laughs> Tragedy and Hope with uh, Carol Quigley. Uh, in 1966, Carol, Professor Carol Quigley of Georgetown University, he was Bill Clinton's mentor, and he said that he was an insider who was groomed by the international bankers. He was basically their librarian. So he had all this information. He didn't disapprove of what they were up to, but they wanted to keep it all secret, and he thought it should be publicized. So he wrote this 900-page book called um, Tragedy and Hope. And this is in 1966, before anybody really heard of the BIS. And he, he said that this was their plan, 
The powers of financial capitalism had another far-reaching aim, nothing less than to create a world system of financial control in private hands, able to dominate the political system of each country and the economy of the world as a whole. The apex of the system was to be the Bank for International Settlements in Basel, Switzerland, a private bank owned and controlled by the world's central banks, which were themselves private corporations. Each central bank sought to dominate its government by its ability to control le the treasury loans. So that was, it was the old thing about allow me to issue and control a nation's currency and I care not who makes its laws. So the, this private central banking system would issue the currency and lend it to governments and make it look like the government was issuing it. And so it was always the government that got in trouble when the um, currencies inflated or failed in some way. Oh, so in Canada, from in 1935, the Bank of Canada Act was pa passed, which allowed the um, the government to fund projects with national credit issued by the bank. We have a no number of Canadians here, and I was just here a couple of there a couple of weeks ago. At the, as we have Paul Hellyer, who is former former defense minister, um, Jerry Ackerman, who is also has run for politics. <laughs> And um, Kristen Wong Tam, who is a, a counselor of Toronto, who is, has been working to institute a, a public bank of Toronto. So, so I'm sort of dwelling on Canada here. Uh, so in Canada, during, that, during the period 1939 to 1974, major productivity was funded, including much of their participation in World War II, uh, education for the returning soldiers, family allowances, old age pensions, uh, the Trans-Canada Highway, St. Lawrence Seaway, and their very excellent universal health care system. It's not so excellent today because of they're now in austerity mode like everybody else and contracting their budget, but at one time it was, it covered everybody and was quite, quite the rave. Um, so you can see from this chart, in 1974 they quit borrowing from their own central bank and started borrowing internationally from other banks. And that's when their debt shot up. Up till that point the debt was quite level and then suddenly it grew to where at its height it was $585 billion. Oops. Um, so we might wonder what happened in 1974. That was when Canada joined the BIS and the Basel Committee, which had been formed that year, in order to uh, maintain the stability of the currency. That was one of their goals. So what this was interpreted to mean was that a stable currency meant you couldn't print money and you couldn't borrow from your own central bank, which would ex supposedly inflate the money supply. Uh, but in fact, what it did was force the governments to borrow privately at interest, and that's what shot the debt up. Um, in, so in fact, today, most money is created privately by banks. You could, the easiest way to demonstrate this is with a chart of the money supply. This is M1, M2, M3 going up to 2006, which is when they quit, the Fed quit reporting M3. Um, M1 is what we normally think of as money, that's coins, dollar bills, and checkbook money. So coins and dollar bills are like halfway up the blue line. So even if you assume that dollar bills are federally issued, which we could argue about because the Federal Reserve is actually composed of 12 Federal Reserve branches, all of which are 100% privately owned by the banks in their district. But even if, if you count that as government money, you can see that most of the money supply comes from somewhere else. And this is money created on the books of banks when they make loans. And how they do it, this is a chart from Modern Money Mechanics. Why this is important for the whole public banking movement is that it refutes an argument that has come up a number of times. Treasurers in California and Oregon and Washington said, we can't afford to be lending our deposit, you know, our Revenues, we need that money to run the, to run our budget. Well, that's the point. You do not you, a bank. If you are a bank, if you put your money in a bank, you are not lending your revenues. You're not lending your deposits. The deposit is all that always stays in the bank. So, in this particular chart, 
I can get that to work. So here's an initial deposit of $10,000. Um, the way the system's set up, the bank is then allowed to make a loan of $9,000, holding back 10% in reserve, if, if the reserve requirement is 10%. Then that uh, loan is liable to get deposited into another bank, which, uh, so that's the 9,000 in the next bank, which is holds back 10% and lends $8,100, et cetera, until 10, a $10,000 deposit becomes $100,000. But you see that in each case, these deposits have stayed in the bank. You never go to the bank and say, I would like to withdraw my money, and they say, I'm sorry, we just lent it to Mr. Jones, and you'll have to come back in 30 years when, when he <laughs> repays his loan. It's always there. So likewise, if the state, for example, if California puts all its money in the Bank of California, it's always there. If the state needs it for their budget, they can get it tomorrow, just like with any other deposit account. What the bank then does, if, if they have double demands on the money, like they've already lent it out, and then the depositor comes for it, they borrow it. They borrow it from the, the um, other banks, so they're, they're like brokered deposits. They borrow it at the Fed funds rate today of 0.25%. So if you're a bank, you get to borrow at 0.25%. If you're a state, you borrow it about 5%. So that's the difference. You're, you're, we're giving away a huge amount, we're paying interest on our own money that, we, that where we could be, we could be borrowing it much less and we could be making a very nice income on our revenues that, and we're giving away that income producing power to, to the private banking system. So looking again at this chart, if you add up all the dark red blocks at the bottom, those, that's the interest. If you added them all up end to end, between 1961 and 2006, the Canadian government paid over twice its debt just in interest. So you can see that if um, they had been borrowing from their central bank all along, they not only would have no debt, they would have a very nice surplus today. Uh, this is a chart uh, put out by a group that uh, was arguing that we have to get rid of entitlements, that it's the entitlements that are killing us. But you can see the entitlements are, the, the rather large middle thing is defense. So we won't talk about that, but the, the entitlements, the ones below that, are quite steady. They're not actually going up at all. The thing that's killing us is that great big triangle at the top, and that is the interest. So if you eliminated the interest, uh, you, could, you could keep the entitlements. In fact, you might, like Canada, come out with, they, they might fund themselves the way that GI Bill did, and you might come out with a surplus. Um, this chart on the left, we have a $15 trillion debt, a little over that now, and um, the Federal Reserve reports how much they paid in interest for the last 24 years, so I added that all up. We've paid $8.2 trillion in interest on a $15 trillion debt. So if we had been borrowing from our own central bank all along, we would be $8.2 trillion richer. So we, we would obviously have all the money we need for all those things that we think we can't afford. We could. Um, the, the alien would be pleased with us that we could fund, fund all these things that obviously we have the workers, we have the materials, we just don't have the green pieces of paper, we could get them. Um, France's debt going back to 1973 is equal to what they have paid in interest, that's the little blocks here. So if they hadn't paid interest they would have no debt today. And Canada has paid twice as much in interest going back to 1961 as the debt is today. So again they could have a nice surplus. Uh, this is research from Margaret Kennedy, who show, a German researcher, who has shown that uh, about 40% of everything we buy is interest, if you count up all the hidden interest costs. Because at every level of production, um, producers ha have to borrow to pay their workers and materials before they have a product to sell. Um, <coughs> and that's, oops, sorry. That's also true for, um, for public public projects. So if you, uh, um, if you eliminated interest by borrowing from your own bank interest free or getting the interest back, we c those projects would cost 40% less. Or So the, there are two ways to look at it. Either we could reduce our tax burden by 
or we could have 40% more goods and serv services um, provided by the government than they provide right now. Uh, California could be $70 billion richer had they been borrowing from their own central bank all along. The, this is their general obligation and revenue bonds as of November 2010. Uh, out of $158 billion debt, $70 billion is, in, billion is interest. So that's money that we're basically giving away that we could have kept had we financed it through our own banks. Now, you could argue that the rating agencies might not approve of California borrowing from its own central bank, but the other way to do it is use your bank to generate 5% interest in one form or another and then use that 5% to pay your debt. In other words, you could buy municipal bonds. If you're not allowed to buy municipal bonds, do exactly what the Bank of North Dakota does, generating a nice profit, and then that profit can go to pay your interest. So uh, states are not allowed to issue their own money the way the federal government could, but they are allowed to own banks, as we know from North Dakota. I mean, this is actually an an issue now, but we've done it historically. Walmart can own a bank. There seems to be no reason that a state should be able to have its own bank. Uh, again, we only have one state that does this, North Dakota. It's also the only state that escaped the credit crisis. It's had a budget surplus every year since 2008. It has the un lowest unemployment rate in the country, the lowest foreclosure rate, and the lowest default rate on credit card debt. And we'll be hearing a lot more about that, too, I think. Uh, some people say, well, North Dakota has oil, and that's, that's why they're doing so well. Uh, but there are other states that have oil that aren't doing so well, and you need the infrastructure to get the oil out of the ground, and that's what you need a bank for, to give, provide the credit to build the infrastructure to, to use your, the resources that you have. And there are many other countries that have public banks that also escape the credit crisis. These are largely the BRIC countries. Brazil, Russia, India, and China um, are, have predominantly publicly owned banks. And they did escape the credit crisis. They're showing remarkable growth of 92.7% over the last decade versus 15% for industrialized countries. And you can see from this chart, they're due to overtake us in 2040. So they're growing very well. And we would argue that a major reason is that they have publicly owned banks so that they are returning the profits from, they, they issue credit, fund what they need, and the profits go back to the public to continually funding their own economy. So it's a sustainable feedback loop, unlike the pyramid scheme where you have this sort of parasitic banking system that's feeding off of the economy. Their banking system feeds the economy. Um, although we only have one state so far with a publicly owned bank, there are 17 states that have introduced bills in one form or another, and so that's, that's, our, that's what we do at the Public Banking Institute is to try to spread information on this idea, which it seems intuitively obvious once you get it, but the, the problem is, that there's this huge sort of psychological bar barrier. People say, oh, we've already got too many, we've got too many banks, what, what do we need more banks for? I don't trust government, et cetera. So they, so they have all these sort of preconceived conceptions. But as uh, Roseanne said, once they get the bank and they realize what they can do with it, what they, they realize the potential is of this bank, whether they're Republican or Democrat, uh, once they, catch the vision and catch the concept, it seems like a no-brainer. Uh, so we can have it all, we can escape the debt trap by returning to the system of the American colonists, either issuing our own money um, through the treasury, it, we could, it's totally constitutional, they could issue coins, very large coins, or having um, issuing credit through our own publicly owned banks, either at the federal level or the state or the county or the city level. And we'll be he hearing more about the county idea and even the university idea um, later. So uh, that's my talk if anyone has questions. <laughs>
please give your name and your state. Um, and stand up. Uh, Ellen, yeah, my name is Frank Nussie. I'm here from Pennsylvania. And uh, do you recommend that public banks uh, use fractional banking? Uh, they don't use fractional. That's fractional reserve banking means. Uh, well, me, fractional reserve banking means that you're lending something you don't really have. In other words, you're pretending to have to be lending something you don't really have. If you're uh, ideally the the public banking system of the colonists, they they didn't even pretend that they had gold. These were they were just acknowledging this is credit. They were just issuing credit. That's the same thing that the Commonwealth Bank of Australia did. They just issued credit. It's the credit of the nation. Um, our dollar bills are backed by nothing but the full faith and credit of the United States. So if you are the United States, it's not fractional reserves to say we are issuing our public credit. Um, and e even at the state level, I mean, there, there's an argument there because they don't, it's not really the full faith and credit of California, it's the full faith and credit of the United States. But it's the same basic concept you are returning the profits to the public. So there's nothing fraudulent about this. We the people are getting our money back. It's just a credit system. It's just a way of circulating credit in a fair way that's sustainable, not inflationary, returns the profits to the public. Um, the system we have right now is sort of um, past-based. In other words, you have to have in order to get. You have to have real estate in order to get a loan. The haves can get loans, the have-nots usually can't. Um, but a public a system like the Commonwealth Bank of Australia, or take Brazil, which is an excellent model. Uh, in the 1990s, Brazil was the largest debtor in the world. By a decade later, when President Lula took over the bank, uh, the development bank, the BNDES, and funded everything in sight. So basically, he was just issuing credit for any good development type public project. I mean, not for speculation. In fact, they don't allow speculation. They don't allow derivatives. They put, they give money to businesses that have some good idea that they want to develop. And over the course of a decade, um, uh, he said, isn't it very chic? Don't you think it's very chic that uh, the IMF is now borrowing from us. They became a creditor of the IMF. I mean, how did he turn it around in a decade? It was just a totally different way of doing credit. You issue the credit first. You need to get the money out there in order to get the demand out there, to, in order to pay the workers and materials so you can produce a pr product which then pays off the loan. And if the profits go back to the public, it's not a fraudulent thing in the way that fractional reserve lending was in the 18th and 19th centuries. Hi, uh, John Root from uh, the Society to Benefit Everyone, doing business as common good finance in Massachusetts. Um, what do you think the role of education versus the pragmatism of getting something working is? In other words, are we... Okay. I, it's so hard for people, when you describe the treasurer problem, right? It's so hard for people to understand why we can do this. And I'm curious about the relationship between uh, accommodating the pragmatism, this would work, versus let's try to understand what money really is. Do you, th so the question is, how do you see that balance? Um, well, I do think the first thing we have to do is educate. We can, I mean, we've already seen, we've, we've gone into legislatures and we've tried and in a number of places we've lost because they just didn't get it. So I, I know um, Kristen in Canada was saying that if, if you're not going to win, you really sh probably shouldn't proceed with it because then you establish a precedent that, that somebody, some legislature has decided it was a bad idea and then you have to try to overcome that precedent. Like, unfortunately, we have such a precedent now in Massachusetts. Um, so it's better to educate first, Oops, to get everybody on your side, to talk to the bankers. That, that it's, this is actually an excellent thing for the local banks, as we see in North Dakota. But in California, the local banks don't get it, so, the, so they tend to, to partner with the big banks, who they're all in the same club. Um, 
and so they think they're opposed to it. So, so we've got to get the information out there first. So I think first we have to do the theoretical stuff, but in a sort of uh, educational way. You know, the populist movement of the 1890s, what they did was they got together and they met and they studied. And that was also true in the Alberta Treasury branches, which was a public system set up in Alberta. The first thing they did was they all got together and had little study groups and learned and understood. And um, div you have to develop sort of your grassroots movement first. And you can see with the politicians, they'd be willing if they had a groundswell of support. And you're not going to get the support until people understand what we're talking about here. Oh, I think the mic is. Who's doing the mic? Oh, okay. Hi, Dan Jones from Vermont. Uh, could you, I'm, I'm still having a hard time getting a wrapping my head around your idea of how we get rid of that $15 trillion elephant uh, with some version of quantitative easing. Could you kind of sh well, share okay, that one yeah. again? <laughs> I'm not sure I should have gotten into that, but <clears throat> so let's assume that as the debt comes in, you know, they always pay the debt. They, they, they always, they just roll over the bonds basically. So let's assume that the next time a bond comes in, you, you pay it off like they always do. They pay it off by drawing on their account, but you don't refinance it through another, through another bond. So you, just, you could either leave that as a debt hanging on your, on your books, a debt to the Federal Reserve, which you would call that fractional reserve, uh, I mean, sorry, quantitative easing. In, a, in other words, you, you could still have it as an accounting entry debt but with no interest attached. See, that's what we want to get rid of is the interest. The debt itself is really no problem. In fact, the debt is our money supply, as a number of economists have said. If we didn't have a debt, we wouldn't have any money supply. Like in the 1850s, they wanted to pay off the debt, but they couldn't do it because they needed that. They needed the bonds in order to back the money supply. So let's say we just refinance the whole thing at 0% interest through the Fed. Then everybody would be happy because we hadn't theoretically inflated the money supply. All we did was we changed bondholders. And you don't have to do it instantly. You could just, as the bonds come in, just buy them up with quantitative easing and um, pay off the bonds. But I, I okay. <laughs> Thanks. So, but I would argue, argue, you know, you need some computer models and stuff. That's, we really need some technicians to prove all this stuff with, you know, models and formulas and there's so, economics is such a vague amorphous thing you can you can argue one way and somebody will argue another way and there's no winner but if you had if you had some clear models where you could actually see it work and you go oh yeah well i guess that would work one more question here alan okay uh hi jason bosch from colorado um <laughs> what's the relationship or is there a relationship between the state banks and the federal reserve and the bank of international set, uh, settlements or are the, is it outside of that uh, there would be no relationship with the state banks. Oh, well, no. The Bank of North Dakota does have a credit line with the Minnesota Federal Reserve. So you need one of the functions of a state bank is liquidity. So you need that access to the other banks or whatever to be able to borrow very cheaply. That's one of the advantages of having your own bank. You get to borrow at 0.25% instead of at 5%. And then the Bank for International Settlements is the regulator of, they set the rules. So right now what the big rule is, is the capital requirement. They busted the Japanese banks in 1981 with Basel I, when the Japanese banks were the largest creditors in the world. Then they busted our banks with Basel II, which was basically the mark-to-market rule in 2000. I think we adopted it in the fall of 2008. Or no, sorry, fall of 2007. 2007. And, and now they're attempting to bust, I mean, they wouldn't put it that way, but now what's happening is Basel III is going to bust the small, small, the local banks are all complaining that these capital requirements are just out to get them, that they can't meet those increased capital requirements, and they were not responsible for the problem. I mean, this, these regulations are squeezing the little banks that were operating um, conservatively and it's the big Wall Street banks that can meet the capital requirements that aren't actually getting getting touched by those regulations. So so that entity we do have to deal with and if we're a state bank I suppose we have to comply with that but we're not going to have any, pre we'll be like a Wall Street bank. The, California where I'm from is the eighth largest economy in the world. We have 200 billion dollars in real estate, 200 billion dollars in pension, pension funds, 70 billion dollars in a 
money in a treasurer's investment pool, and that's just money that you know I can count on my hand. So we've got a huge amount of money. There's no way we can't meet our capital requirement. So, yeah. Yeah, okay.